a warm welcome to you if you're here for the first time. To everyone online, wonderful that you're joining us. And uh, we look forward to what God is going to do today. Now, we're welcoming one person into membership at Maranatha, and that's Scott Mifflin. So, Scott, why don't you come on up? There, there's Scott. So sometimes we have groups of people, but Scott has kind of eluded us because of his work schedule. We haven't been able to get him up here. But uh, I just want to introduce you to Scott. So Scott is a, uh, is a guy who grew up in a Christian home. But uh, after being baptized at Wesley Acres as a teenager, in his later teens, he kind of drifted away from the Lord. And then five years ago, you experienced the separation from your wife, and that occasioned some searching, but not necessarily in the right direction. But then a year ago, about something happened to you, and Scott, I just want to tell you, what, ter- what caused you to turn a corner in your faith? Well, I... It should be, yeah. I was able to uh, get a Bible. I, I, after seeking, as Pastor Tom said, in the wrong places, um, once I got back into the Word and started seeking a church, uh, I was led to Maranatha. Uh, Maranatha. Uh, thank goodness, uh, a sister in Christ, she suggested I look for an Alpha program. And I found one that happened to be starting eight days after my search and showed up in the parking lot and met Mike Van Dyke and we've become friends since and ran into Linda and Wendon Wadham who I grew up with in the church and uh, you know that was God's sign to me that I found the right place and I, I wanted to find a place that was sound in the word and that had a lot of outreach programs to help others so I feel really blessed to be here. And you've been busy. You are busy already in the church. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, I took the Alpha program last fall, and then uh, the most recent Alpha session, Linda asked me to be a leader, a group leader, and then uh, be the MC as well to give Sarita a little break. And I was blessed to do that, and then just recently was asked to join the leadership team for Alpha. So I, I feel very blessed to be involved in that as well. Great. So whenever a member or several members join the church, people join the church, we use it as an occasion to just simply reiterate the bond that we share. We are a a church that is committed to one another, and we actually have a covenant that describes how we are committed to one another in, in, in maintaining our unity and loving one another and using our gifts to serve God together. And I just want to ask you, Scott, you, you love Jesus? Yes, I do. And you love his word? And, yes, for sure I do. And you are committed to walking with all of these people, loving them, um, and using your gifts to work alongside of them? Yes, I do, for sure. And now you, congregation, have the opportunity to, you know, just express your support to Scott and our commitment in this journey together by answering the following question, we do, God helping us. So do you, as a congregation, commit to receiving Scott as a brother in the Lord, loving him and supporting him and working alongside of him in this, this particular church called Maranatha? Congregation, what is your answer? You do. God helping us. Amen. Thank you, Scott, and a warm welcome to Maranatha Church. Yeah. Would you stand with me? And uh, every week we have a greeting. Not not all churches do that. You know, the pastor raises his hand and greets. And the reason we do that is because every letter of the Apostle Paul or, or any author always starts with a greeting. And it's a way of bringing God into the picture right away and letting people know that that God is here with all of his blessing. And so I want to pass along a greeting to you from him. Grace to you, everyone. His love and peace be with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And why don't we just take a minute to greet the people around us before we begin to sing praise.
Thou long expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in peace. Israel, strength and consolation, know of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart.
let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this
execution I see. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. And I live, adore you. may be seated. Let's stay in this place of worship. We're going to let the kids go. Um, they're going to go out that door to their Kids Up program. Parents, feel free to walk with them. But let's just try to stay in that place of worship as we move into prayer. Now, we've been worshiping this incredible, amazing God, and now we get to talk to him. It's just a seamless a seamless movement from praise to to prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that week after week we could come to this place and we could worship you because we know that many believers around the world do not get this privilege. And Father, we never want to take it for granted. And so just thank you that we could be together every week, that we could look to you. And thank you, Lord God, that you are our rock and that in a world that is very uncertain and where our lives are very uncertain, we can come and focus on you and remember that that is the heart of reality. Father in heaven, we pray that as long as we are on this earth for for every, for as many days as you give us, that we could shine a light for you We pray that this would be true for each one of us individually. At the beginning of the service, Scott Mifflin committed to walk this journey with us, and part of that journey is just being a light for you in our lives, always honoring you in everything we do. And we pray that this would be true for us as a church, that in our our worship, in our witness, in our service, in our meetings together, everything we do, would have that one focus, and that is to please you and bring glory to you. Our Father in heaven, uh, this week we received an update about what's happening in those back acres as we are trying to find out how can we use the other half of this property to be a blessing to our community. And we just thank you for the way you've been helping this team And we we just continue to pray, God, that you would make your will clear in this and that one day we could, whatever we do back there, that it would cause us to shine a bright light for you in Belleville. Father, this world is really in a bad place. We think of the conflict in Ukraine, the ongoing conflict in Gaza. And we ask for your mercy. And along with the Open Doors ministry today, Lord, we want to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world who are in jail cells or are experiencing other restrictions just because they want to do what we're doing so freely here. Father, it's not Ukraine or Gaza, but our congregation or our denomination finished their annual meeting called Synod, and some pretty important decisions were made. And now uh, the, the church has to live those out. And we're asking for grace throughout. Father, the teens are going to be going away this week on a trip. They're going to be worshiping. They're going to be serving you. They're going to be having fun at Canada's Wonderland, but we we pray that it would, it would be more than just a fun experience. We, we pray that it would be a life-shaping experience and a bonding experience for them. 
And Father, we just want to give you praise along with some members of our congregation who are looking forward to uh, special events. Peter and Linda Campanar, who celebrate their 40th anniversary today. Jim and Karen Wanamaker, who celebrate 52 this coming Monday. And Matilda Wiarda, who will celebrate her 86th birthday on uh, Wednesday. Thank you for all of these people and the joy that they can have and the joy that we can have with them. Lord, thank you for hearing us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have uh, just a few announcements uh, before we move to the message. And uh, that is that this summer, uh, the, a lot of ministries will, will end or take a pause for the summer. Not all of them, but many of them. But uh, we also are doing new things. And so every Thursday through July and August, the hub will be open in the cafe. And if you just want to come and hang and talk to people and have uh, just have something to do, bring your kids. There will be uh, things you can do as a, as a whole family together. Also, I want to announce the bands. So somebody was saying that they don't, that was an odd word to them. It's just a legal word that's, you know, when, when someone's getting married, you know, by a pastor, uh, then the pastor does all of the legal, you know, stuff, and we call it bands instead of a license. But uh, this coming Saturday, the 29th, at 4.30 p.m., uh, Carlene Cicchelli and Matthew Visser, uh, son of Michael Visser, is getting married and uh, they are getting married by their grandfather, Pastor John. So we congratulate them and uh, just uh, let you know that. And then this today, we're going to have uh, elections, a pretty important moment for us. We're going to be electing some elders or deacons. You've seen their names in the bulletin for the last couple of weeks, so you could read about them and, and know how to vote if you're a member here at Maranatha. And so what we're going to do is after the final song that we sing today in the service, we're just going to ask you to sit. This is a process that takes five minutes. Just ask you to sit, and uh, those people who are members of the church will vote from among those people for who they would like to be their new uh, elders and deacons. Uh, and I should say this, elders and deacon, and I should say uh, this, that there was some discussion about moving away from a voting system to just kind of trusting God and taking names out of a hat from a slate of people who have been approved. Well, that was a discussion, but that wasn't a decision. We would have to change our church constitution to do something like that. So we're still voting the way we always have uh, in these elections. And finally, uh, we, have, we encourage uh, two offerings every week. We always encourage an, an offering for Maranatha Church because we're doing important work. And then today, we're also encouraging a second offering for Momentum Campus Ministries, a ministry that I think is now on seven campuses, uh, led by Steve Coy. Uh, just God is really working and using it to touch the lives of people in colleges and universities. And so um, you can go online to give your offerings, use the debit machine in the back, sign up for monthly withdrawals or put the offerings in the box that you see at the doors just before you leave the foyer. And that's, as, uh, that's the announcements for today. And now we're going to turn uh, to God's Word. And we are continuing a series of messages called The Return of Christ. And we're talking all about what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. Well, um, today we're going to talk about a pretty significant Part of what's going to happen, and that is the resurrection uh, of Jesus, and how our hope in that gives us the ability to be resilient. And so, let me just pray once again before we dive into God's Word. Father in heaven, we really, and my prayer is that above all, we could see Jesus today. Because if we could see you in all of your glory and all of your love, Lord God, I just know that, um, that it would be everything that we need for today and this week and forever. And this is just one little part of your word, but it points to this amazing central truth that, 
the early Christians announced throughout the whole world and were prepared to die for because they, they knew what they had seen. And we're asking you, Lord God, let us see it today, what so animated them, and let it fill us with hope. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, our reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read just verses 1 through 5. Uh, I wanted to go 10 verses, but there's just so much in this that 5 is all I could reasonably manage, I thought. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you can read it on the screen with me if you don't have your own Bible. And Paul says, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And that's as far as we're going to read today in God's Word. So as I mentioned a moment ago, we're talking about resilience. And resilience is the ability to experience a hardship in life, a physical setback, a financial setback, a relational setback, and to be able to bounce back, to be able to find reason to keep going and be hopeful about life. And I can hardly think of a quality that is more vital for you and me than resilience because life is hard. That is a non-negotiable fact of life. And you're either going to be resilient or you're going to be just overwhelmed by life and depressed by life. Uh, recently, I was reading and I read this incredible illustration of resilience. The person was talking about the experiments that were done in the Arizona deserts back in 1980. So they were studying how could we have, how could humans go to another planet, say Mars or the moon, or, you know, moon's not a planet, but you, you know what I mean? And so for that to happen, they would have to be able to uh, support themselves, and so they created what they called the biosphere, the biggest such project ever to be done on Earth, and the idea was they were going to put uh, I think there were eight people, they were going to put them there for a period of several years, and they, would, they could only eat what was inside that, that contained ecosystem, they could only drink the water that was there originally or, or uh, produced there, they could only breathe air that was recycled there. Well, the experiment ended a little bit early, and they discovered that... Uh, the environment is a whole lot more complex than they ever realized. For example, who'd have thunk it? But their trees would grow up, they were trying to create a rainforest, and their trees would grow up and they would reach maturity and they would fall down. All their trees were falling down. And what they figured out is that trees need wind. They must have the adversity of wind blowing against them because that is how their wood gets strong. And that is how their roots grow deep. And without the wind, they just can't even support their own weight. And what a beautiful picture of what resiliency is. God's intention is that through all of the hardships of our life, through all of the things we cope with, that as we process them with Him, we grow stronger all of the time and our hope becomes more resilient because we realize we can get through this. 
And, and, and on we go from strength to strength. Now, Paul doesn't mention the word resilience or resiliency in this passage, but what he does do is he gives us truth designed to make us resilient people. And especially, I will say, Paul's focus is on the hardship that comes through physical difficulty. So if you experience physical difficulty, chronic pain, this is kind of thing, God is talking to you, Paul is talking to you. But of course, he's talking to all of us. You know, he's talking about the anxieties we all feel and how to just be, uh, to bear up under those. And if we incorporate these truths into our life and, and take them, then we will be resilient people. Now, Paul lays down this first principle, which is really important if we want to be resilient, and that is expect life to be hard and difficult and short. The first thing that undermines resiliency is the belief that everything's going to go well, and Paul bursts our balloon right away by telling us that life is short and hard. And so get your expectations around that. Look at verse 1. He says this, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So Paul is talking about our bodies. Here we're in a tent, and there we will get an eternal dwelling created by God, which is a new body. That's what he's talking about. Not the place, but our bodies. But what I want to focus on is what he, he says is that we live currently, this body, he says, is a tent. Now, what do you know about tents? How many of you have ever tented in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, well, just about everybody, right? I'd like to ask, well, how many of you are still tenting? Raise your hand. Whoa, a lot fewer, right? We want a more permanent place, as Paul is suggesting here, right? My uh, recollections of tenting, because Janet and I would tent with the kids once a week, every year, and we've actually started to do this with our own grandkids, and I have happy memories of that one week a year in a tent, no more, but I also have some hard memories, or, or not so pleasant memories. I remember wet sleeping bags, I remember tent poles falling over in the middle of the night, and the tent kind of collapsing. One time, I got up in the middle of the night, the, the wind was just, it was not wind, it was a train coming down the train track, just and the, the water was just pouring down, and a tent flap was open, and water was getting in and making the tent wet, and so I had to go out in the middle of the night in the pouring rain, and I'm standing there trying to tie down this tent flap, and isn't this cute? I realized that there's someone next to me, and I turn, and there is Janet holding an umbrella, isn't that cute? You know, that's a, just a beautiful picture, actually, in our lives, you know, and so symbolic, right? Well, anyway, great, romantic moment, but the next morning, this is what we found uh, out. The director, we were at Fair Havens Campgrounds, and he told us that there was a tornado bearing down on Fair Havens, got very close, then jumped over the campground or somehow skipped over to one side and was diverted. I mean, power lines were down everywhere, but it didn't come on the campground. And all I could think about was, we were in a tent. You would have been picking birds out of the trees the next morning, right? This is a flimsy, temporary thing. And I, I, I never realized really how weak it is. And, and bears, oh, just go in your tent, right? and you'll be fine, right? This is Paul's point. This body we live in, it's just that. It's a tent. It is flimsy, and life is short. But look what he goes on to say, because he goes from bad to worse. He says, verses 2 and, and 3, he says, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Now, a lot of scholarly ink is poured out on this word naked and then later unclothed. What is Paul talking about when he says we groan because we don't want to be naked? And 
I'm just going to cut through. It's a long discussion, and, and I, don't, I don't think it substantially changes the point, so I'm just going to tell you what I've come to believe about this. What I believe Paul is saying is what he's been saying throughout this whole section that he's been talking about, and he's basically saying this, I believe, that this over here in the future, we will be clothed with this eternal body, and as long as we are not, we are in this other place here, which is called nakedness or being unclothed, which means we are totally subject to death and mortality and the wearing, life is wearing out constantly. And Paul really, who was always being whipped and beaten, he was a guy who knew, he said, we were always carrying around in us the death of Jesus. And so Paul is basically, I believe, saying we groan in this body because we are unclothed now and we long to be clothed, not subject to death he says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, outwardly we are wasting away. Isn't that all of our experience? People magazine started naming the sexiest man alive back in 1985. The first sexiest man alive was Mel Gibson. He's not the sexiest man alive anymore. He's, he, he may get an award for being the oldest man alive if he hangs in there. And that's the whole thing about the Sexiest Man Alive Award. It, it's, you've got to get it at a certain age because life is not trending that way in the long run. I, I remember uh, seeing a cartoon. Uh, uh, I thought it was funny. There was, a, there was an old gentleman. He had you know, bent over like this to tie his shoe. And then he looks up at his wife and he says, Is there anything you need while I'm down here? <laughs> You know, but the thing is, it's like, you know, you get that if, if, if you're an older person. You, you, we just can't move. And, and that is, life has its ravages. But listen, this is not just something for older people. Rennie Vanderwall and I, we sit down with the, uh, the pastoral care list and we review it every month. Who is suffering? Who is shut in? And, and we go over it, and it, it really, it's, it's hard to know that people really are carrying chronic pain in these things. But here's the thing, it's not just the older people. There are people on that list who are just too young. We even have a young adult whose, whose relationship to her body really includes a lot of misery. She hasn't emerged age 30 yet. And, and, and I don't want to sound morbid here. You know, if, if you're, you're a younger person and, and you're, you're athletic and, and, you know, I just say, go for it. You know, we, we celebrate these, you know, these elastic gymnasts who perform in the Olympics and professional athletes. This is a gift of God and go for it. But Paul is saying, be realistic. The people announcing those events are are gray-haired people who used to do those things. And always frame your life within the realism that life is, is not supposed to be long and easy, but that it is, it is a short and very hard thing sometimes. Well, then Paul says, here's the second principle that will help us all be resilient, and that is we need to keep our focus on what is ahead. Not first of all here, I mean, we've got to do our daily life, but we have to keep our focus on what is coming, because what is coming is far, far greater than what we have here. You see, I'm, I'm glad I'm a Christian. Paul was glad he was a Christian, even though life was physically very difficult for him. But despite all God gives us in this life, it does not compare to what's coming. We, we, we only experience the, the merest tiny bit, 99.99999% of what God promises is yet to come. And one of the things he promises is what he describes in verse 1. Let's go back there where he says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed... We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This tent is so flimsy, and we're naked in this world, 
But we look forward to the fact that we're going to have this comparably this mansion of, of, of a body. Jesus Christ died on the cross. And if we have faith in Jesus, then the Bible says, and we died with him, he brought us with him in dying to sin so that he could not rule over us or keep us out of heaven. And he rose again, and that means that if you have faith in him, that will be your reality. Jesus was the first one to rise, but he said, when I return again, all of those in me will rise. Death cannot hold them back. And so he says in verse 4 that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life when Jesus returns. And he expresses it even more picturesquely in 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 55, where he says this, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has clothed uh, has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? In that day, those nimble gymnasts who awe us and those athletes who can awe us with their prowess will be nothing compared to the, to the lowliest person in their heavenly body in heaven. In that day, um, joints gnarled by arthritis will be straightened. Limbs that are, are atrophied or paralyzed will be strong again. Minds that are confused will be sharp again. We will have a body like Jesus. He's the picture of our future. Now, I wonder... To what extent we really have taken this truth home? You know, maybe you have. I'm not questioning if you have. But I'll, I will tell you this. For far too long, my hope was way too spiritual. And what I mean by that is this. I thought my hope was to go to heaven when I die. And don't get me wrong, I do want to go to heaven when I die. But that is not the great hope that Paul holds out or the Bible holds out. Heaven is just a stopover place until the new heavens and the new earth come and, and we get our heavenly bodies. And my view was too spiritual. You know, my view of what, what awaited us uh, was just a big white sheet. I could not come up with an exciting idea of what heaven was like and so, of course, this world seems more exciting than the next. But our hope is very physical. Jesus rose in his body. That's a big deal. And the promise that we're going to explore next week is that there will be a whole new heavens and earth. And when you start to catch on to the physicality of the promises that we hold on to, suddenly you can start to get pictures because who you are in your body and what this world is as a physical entity, if you could just kind of multiply it by about a million times in terms of the best things, then you get more of an idea. You start to get a very concrete picture of what, what the earth holds. And you know, sometimes I even hear Christians you know, talking about what they're going to do. They got their bucket list. No, I know we just, that's just a colloquialism, but some people really take it seriously. Before they die, they got to fulfill all these things. I got to see the Taj Mahal. I got to do this. Before I kick the bucket. Well, why is that so important unless... What you think about this world is way bigger than what you think about the next, but you've got it completely wrong. Do you have any idea? If you don't do anything on your bucket list, you won't miss a thing in the long run, right? Well, then Paul gives a last principle. We will be resilient if we have realistic expectations about this. Like, we will be resilient if we, we, we have our hope 
firmly set on what God has in store for us and, and don't put all of our hopes in, in what we're going to get in this world. But then thirdly, we have this, what he talks about in verse 5, where he says, Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. God has given us the Spirit. He's come to dwell in us by the Spirit, and this is a deposit. Well, what is a deposit? If someone's going to buy your house, they give you a deposit enough to make it painful if they would ever back out. The intention is that they're giving you a little bit of a foretaste so you can be guaranteed the rest is coming. And God gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. So in this life, we have the Holy Spirit who's in there saying to you and to me, you are a child of God and God loves you and you can do this, you can get through this because I am inside of you and I'm going to go with you every step of the way. And not only that, but he's doing something more. He's, he's working heaven into your very soul. He's working out the life of heaven in you. So even before you face the day of your death, already you're living into this new life. Look at what Paul says back in uh, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, where he says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is uh, unseen is eternal. Now, if, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, go back and read, uh, or go forward in this book and read in chapter 11 his litany of sufferings. This guy should have died on at least a half a dozen other occasions. He was pelted with rocks. He was, he was beaten with rods. He was whipped. Ah, ah, you name it. And yet he calls his tr troubles light and momentary because he was so in touch with the reality of this glory that was being built up inside of this Christ-like life. Now let me give you a modern-day example of this. And it's a familiar example, but... Johnny Erickson is one of my heroes. Now, you as a younger generation, uh, if you're here, you, you, you could benefit from hearing her story and knowing her story and looking into her a little bit. 17, injured in a diving accident, quadriplegic from that point, obviously hard to uh, cope with, but she finally did and committed her life to God completely, and then her life there from, is a story that illustrates what Paul says, that power is made perfect in weakness. She could not have had the reach, the global reach she's had, touching the lives of those with disabilities, touching the lives of those with, who are able-bodied, as she could have as a person in a wheelchair, but life has gone on. She's almost 80 years old, and life in her wheelchair has become painful. She's had recurring cancers. She's had lung problems. And just a couple of years back, I think she's up to 55 years in a wheelchair, nearing age 80, and, but this is what she said at her 52-year anniversary, and I'm going I'm to quote it in full so you could follow it along. She said, every day, I am wasting away. But I am still on the growing side, the strong side, because like the Bible says, I'm growing in two directions at the same time. Outwardly, I am wasting away, but inwardly, man, I'm being renewed day by day. My body may be unraveling, but my spirit, my measure of faith, and my assurance of salvation, and my sensitivity to sin, my confidence in the Word of God, my hope of heaven, my compassion for others with disabilities, my love of Jesus, everything about my spirit is growing. Sure, I am weaker physically, but I am stronger spiritually. Deep, great trials bring with them deep grace from God. And I'm sure there are times when she just says, God, how long? And she cries out, but that's exactly the process by which we gain the strength to live hopefully and be avenues of God's Spirit in this world. 
you know, in a development in society that is so sad is this thing called MAID, right? Medical Assistance in Dying. It's becoming, uh, they're going to, maybe they already have, they were going to expand it, for, you know, for homeless people and, and people with mental disabilities. It's just going everywhere because people precisely lack this hope. They lack the hope that Johnny has, the, the hope that God is holding out. So sure, yeah, just end it all. You know, I, I, I don't know how you say anything uh, more than you're not worth very much, so just end it all. When God says you're so valuable, you're so vital to me, and I've got a future beyond, and I have things to do in your life, don't, don't despair. And so let me ask you, where do you find yourself today? Maybe you're a younger person. You know, I'm reading a book all about the impact of social media on Gen Z and, 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 and this author's uh, belief, and he, he does a good job of proving it. He's, he says social media has done a lot to undermine the confidence of Gen Z and to leave them anxious about life. Well, that's, that may be true for you, of course, anxiety is something we all have right until the day we die. We'll be coping with that. But this is what God says. Life is tough. I know it. But the best is yet to, yet to come, and I will be with you every step of the way. And if you're older and you're suffering with pain, maybe chronic pain, like, my heart goes out to you. And if, if all I had was my own thoughts about looking around the world and giving you advice, I really wouldn't have anything to say to you. But I could tell you from God's word, from a Lord who endured pain like you experience and went to the cross, that he's giving you the same message. Life is tough. I get it. Your life is tough. But the best is yet to come, and I'm working through what you're experiencing and I will be with you every step of the way. I just want to close with this passage today. Paul speaks in another place about hope. Romans 5, 2, 3, he says this. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We'll, we'll pause. Wait, wait. I got the first part. We glory in the hope of God. You know, yeah, heaven's coming, and, you know, and the new heavens and the earth, it's all coming. But Paul says, we also glory in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. Our hope only grows deeper. Hope motivates us, and as we hang on and hang on to the Lord, our hope only grows. Just like Paul, I know it's coming. It gets sweeter as, as, we, as we go through suffering, as we hold on to the Lord, then that hope of what is to come just grows sweeter and sweeter, and we can just taste it coming. And I hope you can taste it coming. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you for... Everything Jesus did. Lord, we were lost. We, were, we would have been totally lost. The human race would have been utterly lost. We would have been lost. But you, Jesus, came out of your incredible love and you died and you rose again. And every day now, Lord, we live or could live with such promise. And so, God, we... We just ask you. And I want to ask in a special way. There are, there are people here, Lord, struggling with, with deep anxieties. There are people here who, who, there may be somebody in here who cannot think of a reason to wake up tomorrow morning and who's thinking of ending it all. Or, or there may be someone who has just been saying, God, how long will this physical pain go on? Uh, Lord, and you know everything in between, but I pray that for them especially today, you would apply your word and let all of us lean on what you have said in your word 
and find strength for what we are dealing with. Glory to you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yeah, let's just remain standing. We're going to sing one more song. Um, and I just want to say that uh, if you're here, if you're a guest um, and you've never done this, there's a, a gift waiting for you at our welcome desk in the foyer. And I hope you'll stop by there. You could even leave your information we can, uh, so we could stay in touch. But also, if you just want to have a coffee and hang and have good conversation, you could do that either in the hub, right, directly that way, or the fellowship hall down that way. Prayer for anyone who would like it is right here at the bottom of the flap, on the floor below the platform near the keyboard. And uh, just remember that after our God's final blessing and then a song, we're going to sit down for just five minutes to have that tiny little meeting. But I wanted to show you this pic, uh, which I showed you at Easter time. And now uh, it's framed and it's on the wall. It just went up this week. Because I love this picture, and that's the picture, uh, somebody's conception of Jesus walking down the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. He's alive, but the two guys on either side they were kept from seeing him so they don't realize and they're all bummed out and they're depressed. They're talking about how sad they were and all the reasons they have to, to be bummed out. And all the while there's Jesus just patiently, you know, bringing them back to the promises of God. I wonder if there's anybody here today who's in the place of one of these disciples. I'll tell you, man, I've been there many times in my life. But I hope this is a picture of hope for you that is as sad as we could be, as much as we could lack faith, it's only the faith that's lacking. There's no lack in our Savior. He's done it all on the cross and through his resurrection. And it's that Savior who says to you, as you go into your week, wherever that's going to take you, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen.
allow me to turn seas into highways.